BlackBerry, very few people had heard of blockchain, and if they had, they, they'd heard of Bitcoin and thought that it was some sort of terrorist activity. So as you can imagine, that's quite a challenge for any startup to develop in an ecosystem that there's no ecosystem. So that's when I met Eric and we went back to UCLA, our alma mater, and said, UCLA, you quote unquote invented the internet. We need to start developing a pipeline of students that will help become developers, business leaders, uh, attorneys, and just basically leaders in the blockchain ecosystem. And that was the impetus of the UCLA Blockchain Lab. Since then, it has grown to the Los Angeles Blockchain Lab, which is a collaboration of academic institutions through Southern California, in particular UCLA and USC, and we're speaking to other schools, as well as a partnership with the city of Los Angeles, lots of nonprofits uh, and uh, businesses, other startups in the community, and we're basically here to help elevate, educate, and innovate in the blockchain ecosystem. Thank you, thank you. Great. So I'm going to give a quick overview of our agenda today. Um, just really quick, want to give a shout out to our speakers. Um, our speakers are from all over the world, and these people are thought leaders, they're innovators, they're entrepreneurs, they're, they're shipping product, building things, and uh, we're very fortunate to have a very stacked lineup of speakers. So hope you guys are all excited for that. Um, really quick, lunch is at 12.15, so if you guys are hungry, please be patient. Um, and our program will go until 6 p.m., followed by an after party hosted by um, our professor, David McFadden's Far From Moscow. <clears throat> uh, for the agenda times and panel names, please look at the website, cyberdays.info, because we are a green campus, so we did not want to waste any paper printing our brochures. So please look at the website for the agenda. Speaking of us being a green campus, I also wanted to welcome you to our facility. This is the oldest building at the UCLA campus, built in the 1920s. So I hope you appreciate the academic institution of, or the academic environment of this institution. And really quickly, I want to give you guys a rundown of the various important locations um, that you will need to know for the rest of your weekend. Our restrooms, men's are on this side, women's are on this side. We ask you guys to please go out through the back and the volunteers will help you direct, um, get directed to the entrances into the building where you can use the restroom. So please, again, do not use any of these doors. Go to the back and our volunteers will help direct you guys. Actually, I know, Eric, you didn't even have time to use the restroom this morning, oh, so I'm going to have to make a quick <laughs> clarification on that. Both the men's and ladies' restrooms are on that side. Okay, there we go. And um, for lunch later, uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll uh, reiterate this later on, but we have campus restaurants for lunchtime uh, scattered throughout the campus. So Ackerman Union is over there, and we also have a variety of cafes, uh, which we will touch upon when lunch comes. And finally, we do have our lounging area right outside. It's a lot of green, and we have a beautiful campus, so please feel free to walk in and out. Uh, as long as just be quiet, do not disturb. Uh, your neighbors if there's somebody pre presenting. Thank you. All right. I well, also wanted to say thank you very much, of course, for all of you for attending. We also wanted to say thank you to our volunteers, our students, staff, and faculty who have made this happen. Uh, and then a special shout out and thank you to our sponsors. We could not have made it without them. Uh, just so you know, we are an academic institution. We tried to keep ticket sales, the cost, as low as possible. Um, so we just barely broke even, and we wouldn't have been able to do that without their support. So thank you very much to Swarm, Consensus, and We Do. Yes, thank you. And then last but not least, we have received numerous in-kind, both in services and time, from other uh, partners, and they are all up on the board. So thank you to them. All right, so we'll get started with the first speaker on our agenda. Um, we have David Moss of Block One. He's going to introduce himself. So please give a warm round of applause for David Moss. Thank you. Our keynote speaker. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Good morning. Thanks for coming out. I want to thank uh, Veronica and Adam and Heidi and Eric for putting on all of this stuff and inviting me here today. Really appreciate that. 
Um, my oldest daughter is actually a graduate of UCLA, so I've been on this campus many times. This is one of the few buildings I haven't been in. Um, so wanted to talk about this. I actually, that little robot, I've got one in my, uh, my bag that I carry around, that exact little tiny robot. So I thought that was very interesting and fitting. Um, background, we're not going to go into. You can look that up on LinkedIn or wherever. Basically, what I do right now and what I've been doing for the last year is working with a company called Block One. And Block One is building a product called EOS. I'll do this. Hopefully, I won't pull off my mic. Little thing right there. If you've ever heard of it, um, we'll get into that a little bit more and we'll explain what, what exact, exactly that is. My job, my um, responsibility is to actually get that out the door. And so all of my teams around the world in Blacksburg, Virginia, Orange County, Los Angeles, Portland, Oregon, St. Louis, Missouri, Pensacola, Florida, Hong Kong, and Budapest, Hungary are working on building EOS right now. And we have a test net out. We'll talk about those things and everything. But what I really want to do is kind of take you through some other things that were... Um, you know, the, the dawn of blockchain is really the type of the, 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 the name of this speech right now. So I wanted to talk about the dawn of blockchain. And way back when, when we were first starting to figure out all of the technology, we came to this. Okay, wait a second. That's probably a little bit too fast. Um, this is a nice diagram. I encourage you to look at some of these things and talk about the blockchain and how it's put together and how a block becomes part of the chain and how it becomes irreversible and all the other stuff. But we've got a little bit of an issue here is that for a lot of people, how many people know what a blockchain is? Can honestly tell me, wow, that's good. Okay, how many people are cryptocurrency investors? Okay, a couple of people. Um, a fair amount of people, that's good. Uh, and how many people have actually programmed uh, something on the blockchain? You've got a couple of people there. So this is, when I talk, when you look at that, that, the reason I like to show that thing from 2001 is you talk about the evolution of things and where things happen. You see a bone going up and all of a sudden we're in space. That's the perception that people have about what's going to happen with the blockchain. Right? We talked about the blockchain. Wow, there's Bitcoin out there. Wow, there's Ethereum out there. Bam, it's all good. We got a blockchain. We can talk, we can save the world now. The world... Ice cream is going to be on the blockchain really soon, I'm just absolutely sure. Okay, well, that's not really what's going to happen. So, here's the general definition of a blockchain. If you're looking at it, it needs to be globally accessible. You need to be able to have decentralized, transparent, single point of failure, no single point of failure, not controlled by a single entity. Those are all great aspirational things. We'll talk about what actually the reality is of some of those things right now. But, first of all, how many of you know what a ledger is? Okay, good. So how many of you actually are accountants? Well, we had a couple good. So, so, so we're going to talk about ledgers because this is all based on ledgers. It's all based on ledgers. So let's talk about what a ledger is. Okay, this, is actually, this actually really happened years ago, many, many millennia ago. People took their their cattle that they wanted to sell and they kept track of how many cattle they had sold and they made little marks in clay. And basically, this was single entry accounting. This is real. There are Sumerian tablets with um, using a number of different uh, cuneiform uh, writing that have all that information on them. And when they were baked, they became a fact. We baked it. It's now time to say that we have this agreement between two parties. So it's single entry accounting. You know, great. That's, that's wonderful. What if you baked in th something wrong? What if somebody lied when they put it down there? You could actually do some fraud. So. We could jump forward a little bit, well, a lot, to uh, the time right before the Medici's, but really popularized by the Medici's, double entry accounting, assets, liabilities, credits, debts, debits, all that stuff. That's great. This is really exciting stuff, right? This is accounting. It's not exciting stuff. Um, but the idea here is that people were keeping track of these things many years ago. Double entry accounting had its issues. Everybody has probably seen plenty of movies and TV shows where somebody said, yeah, well, there's this one set of books, but then there's the real set of books. Okay. That's really what happens all the time, is that people are doing all sorts of fun things with their accounting. Okay, so double entry accounting. These are actual double entry accounting um, tablets. This is how people kept track of stuff for years. That's wonderful. What did it do? Well, you had an outside auditor who, of course, could be bribed 
but you had an outside auditor that could actually keep track of the ledger and say, yeah, yeah, that looks good. That looks like that's how much money they made. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so we had something happen, and there are a couple of different people who are responsible for this. So a number of different things started happening in the 80s and the 90s. We have an, a member of our team, Ian Grigg, who's in London, who is a cryptographer and an economist, and he actually is the co-author of a, a paper on, uh, co-inventor of a paper for triple entry accounting and the idea of decentralization. But basically, this is where we, everybody traces this back to this one statement. This person said, wow, if we had a database that was on a spoke and a hub, not just the network on a spoke and a hub, wouldn't that be cool? Okay, why? Why is that even cool? So if you're looking at it, it's an irreversible double entry. A blockchain is an irreversible double entry accounting ledger that happens to have witnesses decentralized. Okay, what does that mean, a witness? Well, somebody says, yeah, I'm an auditor. Yeah, that's good. What if you had witnesses that were automatic? What if you had decentralized witnesses around the planet that each of them got a copy of that block, wrote it irreversibly, everybody agreed that that was indeed the block that was written? Now you've got a blockchain and you've got irreversibility and you've got transparency, you've got all the stuff that you need to be able to have. What's that being used for right now? Well, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's back up today for all of you those of you who are worried about it when it dropped down to the $6,000, $7,000 mark recently. Um, but it's back up, that's good. But that was the first real entry, the first real use, practical use of a um, third-party ledger with decentralization. We'll talk about the fact that, well, it's not that decentralized and why. But it was the first real use of it as, as, as a cryptocurrency. That's fantastic. I'm not sure if you, you all um, know that. In the Genesis block, the first block of Bitcoin, there is a hidden message from Satoshi. Satoshi, wherever you are. You, anyone, is, is Satoshi in here? Is, this, is, is Satoshi the CIA? Is Satoshi the NSA? I've heard all those rumors. Dan Larimer, who I work with, actually had a lot of conversations back with Satoshi when whoever that was actually was online and talking about this stuff. And basically, that was the whole idea of how do we create a cryptocurrency? This one had mathematical proofs. There's only 21 million of them. It gets harder and harder. And it takes up an extraordinary amount of energy. But, hey, you got cryptocurrency. So there we go, triple entry accounting. Okay, so with Bitcoin, we proved the concept. Now, along came Ethereum. Now, Ethereum was from a, also from a white paper. People are writing how you go about doing this stuff. Ethereum introduced a really interesting, cool concept, which is proving the idea of a smart contract. Back to double entry accounting. Back to single entry accounting. One party, another party, I'm selling you 10 cattle, I'm buying 10 cattle. Now it's recorded, it's permanent. That was the blockchain, that was what was going on. So Ethereum started allowing you to do that. Um, what's next? Well, now we start to look at performance because there's a little bit of an issue with some of those things uh, right now. Um, when you're putting together a smart contract, well, um, these are my friends at Everipedia. You guys familiar with Everipedia? You know who they are? Everipedia is, a, um, is actually a Wikipedia built on the EOS blockchain that we're building, but basically, this is a really long explanation. You can read it if you want, but the basic idea is that a smart contract is a ledger between two parties that's irreversible that goes on the blockchain. It can get more or less complicated. Some of them are very simple. Move currency from this account to this account. Credit, debit. Sound familiar? Okay, that's basically all we're doing. Now, it gets much more sophisticated because smart contracts can trigger many other things. It can trigger um, adding somebody to a, an account for three days, and after the three days, they no longer have access to the account, and they can trade up to 10 Bitcoin. You can put all those kinds of things in a smart contract, and so why is that important? Well, because we want to be able to put this out there for transparency in a number of areas. Banks, financial institutions in general, government institutions, all those things need a certain amount of speed to be able to make it work, right? If you're gonna be doing that, if you, the number of Facebook likes, if you take, take a look at that, right now, there's 100,000 Facebook likes. Actually, it's 52,000. That's actually, this slide is a little bit old now. Um, it's all of, I think, four weeks old. So <laughs> um, it, things are happening even faster. So here's the actual speed. Three transactions a second for Bitcoin. What Bitcoin primarily does is just allow you to buy and sell Bitcoin or create Bitcoin, but it runs at three transactions a second. 
Um, that would be intolerable for anybody trying to run an actual application of any kind. 30 transactions a second, I'm being liberal here with um, Ethereum because actually, you, all, you guys all heard about CryptoKitties? How many of you heard about Crypto? Okay, CryptoKitties, when we actually launched our testnet the day after, CryptoKitties ki almost killed Ethereum. Now, it didn't kill Ethereum, but it almost did. It brought it back so that transactions were running between 8 and 12 hours behind, and they would literally drop off. There was nothing in the code that would say, oh, I need to send an alert if it hasn't come in four hours because the transaction is dead. It was taking eight hours, so everybody was getting all these alerts. Your Ethereum is gone. All because of CryptoKitties. And CryptoKitties rang it. Well, actually, it turned out that during that period of time, Vitalik Buterin, who's you know, an absolute genius, wonderful guy, said we have now sustained 10 transactions a second for 24 hours in a row on the Ethereum network. We are so excited. Okay, that's not going to work either, is it? So, what we're looking at is, over a period of time, I'm going to focus for a little bit on where this came from, where EOS came from, and I don't want to overemphasize the idea of what EOS is and what Block 1 is. I'm talking about where we fit in the overall ecosystem, but back in 2013, Dan Larimer decided to come up with a, a, an exchange called BitShares. He did that as a reaction to Mt. Gox. You guys are familiar with what happened with Mt. Gox? Basically, it was a wonderful exchange until somebody walked off with hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin. It was never found again, but that story isn't even over yet. People are slowly recovering them because you can replay the blockchain. That's the idea of the blockchain. So it was the introduction, by the way, I want to talk about that. Decentralized Autonomous Organization. That's what these are, decentralized. We're calling them now Decentralized Autonomous Companies. But Dan also launched um, BitShares. He also launched a thing called BitShares 2.0, but then also Steemit. And Steemit was essentially, and still is essentially, um, a very small version of Reddit on the blockchain, but all the people who participate in Steemit and write things, they don't have to um, even understand that there's a blockchain underneath it, but there's a whole set of smart contracts and rewards for people who are participating in that project. So that's the foundation for all of those things. And so what we were looking at after Dan got done with Steemit was, okay, I want to build something else where I can build lots of different applications instead of having to rewrite the whole darn thing. So anybody who's a developer in here, you'll definitely recognize the problems with that, is you do not want to have to worry about an operating system. I wouldn't want to worry about Mac OS X or iOS or Android or anything like that. I don't want to build the darn thing. I want to build applications on top of it. That's where we need to go for all of this. And so, what we believe is that there needs to be an operating system sitting inside of the blockchain so that people can add that to their application. Blockchain is a service. You can write your app, you can write your information, you can send your ledger information, you can get information back, you can store it on a, uh, on a ledger, you can do whatever you need to do without having to write all that yourself. Now, there's a lot of other companies that are building various versions of this. Dan Larimer just happens to have architected the three previous ones himself, and so there's a lot of stuff that we've been doing. A lot of people have said, are we using the code that, that came from BitShares and Steemit? And no, we're, we're using a little tiny bit of it. We've written, we have refactored and rewritten so much stuff at this point that I barely recognize the original code. Um, so that's the idea of an operating system. What we did was we decided, well, we needed to build that operating system EOS, we decided, let's put all the pieces together, let's focus on an operating system, and we started building something called EOS.io last May, roughly. We started our token distribution then. I'm not going to talk about the token distribution or any of those things, so the fact even, even bringing it up is probably more information than, than I need to put on there. But what we did was we decided that we built a blockchain operating system very specifically so that we would have the ability to build applications, simple as that. We're actually building one application right now for identity and attestation that um, it's in the early stages, but we believe that that's where a lot of these things are going to come from over time. But essentially, that's what we want to do, is we just want to have a secure blockchain operating system. So when we're putting that together, we need to be able to have some fundamental things. We, like any other operating system, those of you familiar with working with an operating system and getting down in the core there, you need to have a bunch of fundamental things that are already there. And so we're looking at some of those right now. We're talking about inter-app communication, scheduling, all those things are already done. They've been out in our test net since December. We're adding new things all the time. We're working on a, a few new things there, but the idea is, is that we want to have an operating system where you don't have to worry about that part of it. You can build applications. I'll get really techy on here. Everybody 
who, who in here has heard what a loosely coupled architecture is? Okay, got a couple people. Okay, we're building this so that all those applications out there that everybody is currently using, well, you can plug in this part of the blockchain and still be able to do the other things you need to do, but now you've added transparency and irreversibility and you've got the stuff that you can do for a blockchain. That reduces friction in the marketplace, it reduces friction for transactions, reduces the cost of transactions. And so, a little bit deeper, we built this to be you know, literally to have its own governance. One of the things that we're doing is, we talked about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is decentralized, right? Right now, as far as we know, there are only three major groups that are controlling what's going on with Bitcoin as far as the decentralization. Three major mining organizations, everybody else is getting coins here and there. Ethereum, maybe four. What we're doing is we're doing 21 independent block producers. We've done the math on this, and you can go into all of the, the lovely things like Byzantine General's um, uh, problems that you have to solve for algorithms on this. The basic thing is 21 block producers. 21. So that is real decentralization. So that's what we're putting together, and we actually have block producer nomination, we have voting, we're going to embed a constitution in every block, and the constitution is something that can be used in the future for arbitration and identity and attestation. So now you're starting to see, okay, wait a second, this sounds like more than an operating system, and, and, and it is. And so one of the things you'll notice up there, and I kind of sneak this in, network emission allocation, what the heck does that mean? Anybody know? Want to give a guess? Yes. Exactly, how, they, how the blocks are distributed. Basically, what we do is you get EOS tokens, you plug them in, you get your bandwidth, you get your, your uh, database, and then you can get them back after you've done the actions that you need to get, but there's a little bit of extra, what we're calling inflation on there. That extra money, that goes to the block producers. It can be a fairly reasonably lucrative thing to be a block producer, but the other thing that Dan and I have always had in mind is how do we get to universal basic income, that's UBI. So that's what we're working on right now. So we're figuring out a way to do identity and attestation on our blockchain with the, the stuff that we're doing that will allow UBI to be able to be a possibility through us. And we're hoping that other people will, will do that at some point as well. So, um, but there's a lot of hype and confusion out there on the blockchain. I think red is probably a better color than mauve for the blockchain. What do you think? <laughs> and so that's one of the things that happens is I talk with my, my, my friends, my relatives, my kids about blockchain, and some of them get it. I actually had the most interesting thing. Um, I have a four-year-old at home, and I was, I was getting off the phone with something, uh, and it was a fairly exciting thing, because we're, we're building something that looks like it's gonna happen. And she turned to me and she goes, are you gonna become a block producer? It's a four-year-old, and she knew what it meant, and she was playing with Legos, and she knew the difference. But anyway, so you can, everybody can learn. This is a learning curve here. There's a lot of stuff, but this is a very interesting one, and I, I like to show this. It's kind of silly now, but this gentleman right here predicted the following. Now, everybody mocks the poor guy, and, and I'd like to meet him because I think that he was just saying that's just a ridiculous thing and never going to happen. Okay, well, here's the actual market capitalization of Internet companies. You know, obviously the internet wasn't a fad, and oh, by the way, there's this little information appliance thing that would never, that's never gonna happen. That kinda happened, that's an iPhone X. So things do happen. So here are some other blockchain predictions. Got this one from Forbes. Blockchain is not going to change the world. Now, the thing is, well, maybe it won't. Is it gonna change how we eat, how we sleep? I don't know. It's not for everything. It's not for ice cream, for example. That's kind of my classic example. But um, at the time that this was said by Forbes, the crypto market was at $14 billion. Okay, so the current crypto market capitalization right now, and this is wrong, by the way. You know why it's wrong? Because Bitcoin makes up 38% of that, and Bitcoin is up about $1,000 today, so the market capitalization is now over half a trillion dollars. At the end of 2017, it was almost a trillion dollars. Okay, we were starting to think, wow, how, does, how can it go any higher than that? We started to say that when it was getting up to 14 billion and 15 billion and 20 billion. Wow, how can it go any higher for market capitalization? So the thing is, big numbers attract people, right? Especially business people, big numbers. Well, big things, block, you know, 
blockchain is raising all this money. There's billions of dollars that are being raised by ICOs and all this great stuff that's going on. So I changed my definition along with my, my good friend Brock Pierce, who brought me into this whole thing. If you have any, any of you heard of Brock Pierce? Okay, Brock Pierce is kind of the, the guy in LA that started the whole blockchain revolution. It's happening here in Los Angeles as opposed to happening in Silicon Valley because of Brock Pierce. He's the one that's literally funded hundreds of companies, been an evangelist for blockchain for a long time. So this is the definition that we use now, is that we don't, want, we don't really care about the money. We've, we've got enough money from doing this that we don't have to worry about money. What we're really focused on is how do we affect lives? How do we make things better for people? So this is the new definition as far as I'm concerned about billions, billionaires out there. So um, how are we doing that? We're giving the software away. This is a really different model. Our goal is to build this open source software. We're putting it out in various test nets. We're going to release it on June 2nd at 9, I think it's 9 a.m. Is that when the token distribution ends? We've got to do a bunch of little prep things after that. But we're not releasing it. We're giving it to other block producers who will make money running this. So there'll be 21 independent block producers. And we're going to have identity attestation arbitration and universal basic income all baked into the core of this, but we're not running it. We're going to instead take the money that we have, that we've taken in, and it's considerable. You can go look it up. I don't want to talk about it here, but we're going to take at least a billion dollars of that and turn it around and give it to the developer community. So there's extraordinary amount of things going on. There are all sorts of different applications that you can use to make this work. They're in plenty of, plenty of places. Everything in the blockchain is going to move up. Um, I wanted to, let's see, where's the, uh, right here. Is this us? There, there we are. We're very small. We're just right there. This is a big wide world. You're going to be talking about this over the next couple of days with all sorts of fantastic people that are doing all the stuff that they need to do to be able to make the blockchain work. And th that's why you're here. You want to find out more about it. You want to be a part of this community. You want to be a part of everything that's happening. And that's how big this is already and how, much things, how many things are going on. You're going to learn a lot more over the next couple of days and meet some fantastic companies. I'm so glad Consensus and other companies are here. Um, there's a, so much going on. There's so much to get excited about in the blockchain right now. And is it going to change the world right now? Uh, is it going to change the world over the next 10 years? Yeah, yeah, it'll change the world. Like any other revolution, you don't just throw a bone up in the air and it automatically becomes a spaceship. You don't just say, I've got a blockchain operating system and you already have peace in the world and you're already helping people to get propane and other things less expensively because you figured out a way to do peer-to-peer. -peer. So this is basically um, um, the, Dan, Lerum, I, who, Dan Lerum and I who work together to build this. We basically say what we want to do is find free market solutions to secure life, liberty, and property for all. So that's the underpinning of what we're doing with the EOS blockchain and many other organizations are joining us in that, that um, approach. And I really want to thank everybody for coming out today. I hope you learn a lot more in the next couple of days about the blockchain. And um, uh, I have some contact information if you want to take a picture of this. If you want to get a hold of me and um, ask any questions, there's some other things out there. I've added VC at block.1. We already have half a billion of our funds available uh, that we're taking uh, applications for, for people building applications on the blockchain. And I encourage you to learn. Go out there and learn and enjoy and see whether or not it's something that's for you. But I have a number of people who, that I know who've gone all in on the blockchain for everything. Me too. So anyway, thank you so much for having me today and have a great rest of your day and tomorrow. Yeah, that's perfect. No, that's great.